so it's been about 25 years since the incident. Uh, my mother was driving into, it was, it was very clear from the record that it was her fault. She, we were living in LA at the time, and she was driving into an intersection. And she had passed the stop, and she did not see the truck coming. And I was too young to even know what was going on. But just before they were almost hit, the trucker, the trucker just looked at her and went, ah! <laughs> and so, so in LA. <laughs> So my mother, she she could have gotten the the you know a very offensive finger. She could have gotten you know a scolding look, but the trucker chose to make light of the situation because it was a narrow miss, but it was okay. And my mother never forgot that. Twenty five years later, she has a lot of kids that are telling a lot of jokes about a lot of things where they could have died. <laughs> and uh, so, what does that have to do with anything? Here's a picture of me and my daughter, and this is a. This is appropriate because the tale I have today is both happy and very tragic. And there you go. I think we can laugh out of that. I don't want you all to laugh. You can laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing is a very social activity. It's one of the. It's like it's like yawning. If you yawn, you're gonna start yawning. It's not like hiccuping. I hiccup. You all just stay there. And it's one of those strange diaphragmatic processes that uh, that is social laughter. So. What, what difference does that make? Well, why should I be talking to you about laughter? Well, someone in my wallet said, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Another uh, said, you're a funny guy. That's so funny you're actually cracked this up. So, having established my credentials, let's uh, go to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about humor in the workplace. Yeah, one of the people you recognize right off the bat is the jester. The jester was the one guy who could ridicule the king. The king, you know, he would have some bad ideas. All the history has proven that kings have lots of bad ideas. And not a lot of people could, could stand up to them. The jester was, was the guy in charge of that. And history, you know, has eliminated them. Like, you know, we have the story of the, the Kafir Chaka in, in Africa, like, where the, the jester got everybody laughing. Ha 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 ha. And right after the king said, kill that dog. He has made me laugh. <laughs> you laugh at the death. <laughs> yes, this, you, you laugh now. It's, it's, but it was not, did not work out so well for the jester. And we have we have since continued this mindset where we kill off the jesters, but we keep the kings in place. We had the heroes that we depended on to find our solutions. We we expect the doctor to give us the operation. We expect the engineers to give us the gadget that'll fix it. The, we expect a president or a CEO to solve all of our problems. That was how it went for a long, long time. And we figured out since, enlightened that we are, that uh, we, it takes a team. It takes lots of minds. None of us is, is going to be as stupid as all of us. Thank you. That's a spare poster. It's not original. But uh, what, what is the role? So yeah, so I said we have we don't have the kings, we don't have the heroes anymore. It's it's a team thing. So, what role does laughter have in your team? How are you going to get the laughter into your team? Well, uh, oh yeah, <laughs> oh shoot. Okay, so John C. Maxwell, he ta in his book Five Dysfunctions of a Team, he uh, talked about two. Of, let's see, two of them were yeah, fear of conflict and absence of trust, okay? I didn't, couldn't take the time to memorize those. But those are two of the dysfunctions of a team. And they are very easily conquered by laughter. In this other book that I didn't care to buy, uh, <laughs> I got this, uh, so this uh, Peter Honey. Uh, he talks about the four people that a team needs. The needs, the leader, the doers, the thinkers, and the care. So I, I was able to, to capture this small portion of the book, and I will read it if you cannot read it. And it says, the carers generate team cohesion through growing strong relationship, relationships within the team. And there's some more, but it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I submit to you that like, the carer's job is not so simple. The care, you know, the care, you know, we usually think of it as you know the person who's got the soft skills, so you can make everyone happy and kind of, you know, prevent anyone's feelings from getting hurt, but 
as someone who's better, the humorist, I submit to you that the humorist is better for this job. And I want to differentiate for a second the, uh, the humorist from the comedian. Can we kind of throw in the humorist to the other end with the, with the comedians and the pranksters and the jokesters and the jesters and the fools and the idiots? And that's kind of, that's an unfortunate, that's an unfortunate uh, clumping together. The, the comedian, you know, the comedian is going to give you memorized jokes. He's going to draw attention to himself. His, his objective is to, you know, get laughter for himself. It's the Michael Scott type. You know, you've seen it. You had a boss like that, which is why that show has resonated so well in so many cultures. You've seen the comic, and your office is overstaffed with them. We don't need any more comics, which is why in so many interviews where I kind of, kind of talk about my humor skills, I don't get calls back. That doesn't... I, I've... I now call humor interview aside. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a death sentence every time. But, but the humorist, they, the strategic humorist, uses humor to get us not focused on himself, but to get us focused on the task, to get us back to work. As I said, when you're in a team and you have the bully, yeah, maybe a, a leader who's maybe overleading, the, the humorist knows how to cut them down to size without, you know, really making them feel that bad, kind of getting us back on task, making the jokes, to get us back to work. I'll just talk about just a few such instances where, well, yeah, I've got a few instances. I've got stories to tell you. But so like the, the humorist knows how to use humor as a social lubricant, as an icebreaker, if you, if you if social lubricant gives you, if you don't like that. No. <laughs> so so the, the humorist is gonna take Oh, you're all distracted. Okay, now you're all there. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Okay, take but the humorist. It, it, the, there are social. There are studies that have shown that, in all other things being equal, the negotiator who can use humor is is more likely to get past impasse. He's able to get people to get out of their their pretense. But once you're laughing, all the pretense is stripped. You have revealed yourself that you are an emotional human being. So this worked for me really well when I was working in a mine. I had to do some internal consulting, and I was new. I just I had just been there for a few weeks, but in order, I had my task was to to improve communication between the managers and the miners working underneath underground in the mine. And as I'm trying to gather this data, I'm trying to get them to talk to me. They they looked at me. The miners looked at me skeptically, like, "Oh, he's just a tool working for the for the man, and he's just gonna he's kind of on a witch hunt, a typical HR witch hunter." And that, we won't talk to him. And you know, I needed to get this data, and I could have, I could have maybe had the manager come and accompany me and, and make him talk to me, but right, it was just easier to point a few jokes at myself and say, "Yeah, it's true. I've got you know my pitchforks out back. As soon as you tell me what I need to know, and my torches and pitchforks, uh, witch hunt joke." <laughs> there you go. Okay, but but just by getting them to laugh, they opened up. And we got the data, and we were able to help not just the management team, we were able to help the workers. Just It could have been this horrible process where I'm having to force people to talk, but just that social lubrication caused by laughter, shame on you for thinking, um, <laughs> is, was able to get the ball rolling. Okay. Another instance, uh, do I have a slide for this? No, I don't have a slide for this. Okay. okay. <laughs> Most of the slides say in black text, this uh, slide intentionally left blank. But, uh, you guys are a great crowd. So I, I play a lot of intramural sports, and I play them very poorly. But I've got a lot of friends who really like to play. Some of them are here, and uh, and a lot of them really care about winning so much. You know, and you you, you think that you know the college educated people could not wouldn't care about a game that means nothing, but they do. And often, during soccer games and, fl and flag football games, people would come to fisticuffs. They, would, they were ready to duel to protect their honor, and they wanted to punch each other's lights out. And it was, you know, well, you take a, a, the humorist, you know, the guy can, can jump in and mediate and say something like, hey, I can tell you guys really like each other a lot, but if you can't keep your hands off each other, I'll give you both a spanking. <laughs> Just think about what that does to someone who's ready to punch someone else. Yeah, have you ever just tried just grasping anything very tightly while laughing? Like if you're at a party and someone is really giving you the good jokes, you have to put down your glass because you're just kind of. <laughs> so, just the physiological effects. Think about so in this way, humor is not a time waster. It is a time saver. Think of how much time we would have wasted if we had had to take 
my teammates to the hospital or take them to the honor code office because they had gotten a red card for fighting over a silly foul. It's the, it's the, why the humorist is different from the comic because he is saving you time by getting us back to work, back to focus on our children's game, getting us back, you know, doing the business. Okay, since I did not memorize everything, I must look at this other part. Okay, now it's appropriate to talk about how uh, humor really is good. Here's what Viktor Frankl said. You know who Viktor Frankl is? You're not paying attention to me, you're reading the slide. He said, to see things in a humorous light is some kind of a trick. Learn while mastering the art of living. And so Viktor Frankl, is, you know, he's the, the logotherapist who had you know, survived the, the Holocaust uh, camps, the Nazi camps, and, uh, and he went on to have a, well, he continued his career in, in, in therapy, in psychotherapy. So this, this is kind of helps to see that how your humorist in your office, your strategic humorist can be a healer. Like, uh, so when I was a, when I was a missionary back in, uh, in Chile, Chile, uh, we had to, we had very limited support funds to survive. You know, we're just kind of like, you know, the, the, the Mormon equivalents of uh, the monk. And we're living this life of poverty and solitude, and uh, we have our limited support funds that, that come in on our, on our little cards, and we, we use them to buy uh, little propane tanks to fuel our showers. Our showers were connected to our propane tanks, like the ones that you Americans have in your barbecues. And you light the shower on fire and you shower. Well, when, when the money runs out, the first thing to go is the propane. You can't afford the propane. You can, you can, afford to, you can buy food, but you cannot afford the tank unless you have the money. So when we didn't have the money, everyone had to take cold showers. And this is very depressing for people who are, you know, Chile is very chilly. All right? it, 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 it seems that it's, South America should not be so cold. But it was. So we have these kind of de missionaries who are getting depressed because the, the showers are cold. And so the solution, you know, we could have gone, I, I didn't have any money and I didn't have any gas. But what I could do was I could go into their apartment and take a shower and just laugh as I'm just, just putting a good face on this very painful cold shower. <laughs> and just, kind of, just singing about how much I love the cold shower. And, you know, it all, so if you just give an example of just giving an example to others of how you can deal with difficult times with a smile on your face will do more than just throwing money at the problem, which is especially important, important when money is non-existent. And a final note, which I don't have an anecdote for because it's just happened so much that uh, I don't really even have a specific instance of it, but your, your humorists are going to be the guys and the ladies, the gals, who are not afraid to be an idiot. And that's very important because if you... Uh, Jeff Dyer and Clay Christensen and uh, Hal Gregerson in their book, The Innovator's DNA, they ask, how willing are you to look stupid? Are you willing to ask the stupid questions? Are you willing to look like a fool during brainstorming sessions or any time when you're out gathering information? I submit to you that your humorists, having failed in their jokes several times before, are going to be more willing to look like an idiot. They're going to be asking the stupid questions to point out, ask, why doesn't the emperor have any clothes? Why are we doing with these kind of, they, they can see the social incongruities and they can kind of see the, they, they notice, they notice and they will joke about it and they will ridicule it, but they will also say, give out those radical ideas that make it safe for others to give their radical ideas. You know, they are going to be the ones, yeah, like I said, when we, when we stand and say something stupid, we make it possible for others to say stupid things. That is the, the gift that a humorist gives you in your group. So my call to action is not to develop your own sense of humor. Uh, you know, Sigmund Freud, he's probably wrong, but he said, well, he said, you know, it's, it's the humor or wit, depending on which translation you read, is that he, it's one of those uh, psychic processes, psychical processes that it develops independently, kind of like the imagination or the intellect or the memory. You could develop it, but it would take a lifetime. It would take a lot of money. It would, take, it would be really a bad idea for uh, a company to try to develop a sense of humor in each of its people. But what you can do is you can look for the humorists already in your organizations. Maybe they are a comedian who just needs a little bit of training. But if you can leverage the, the strengths, the humorous strengths of the people already in your organization, as I showed, they will have an effect that will make it easier for people to work in teams. They will help you, they will be a catalyst for new and innovative ideas. They will make people want to work in groups. They will make, people, they will make better teams. So my call to you is to, is to find that talent and use it and 
you know, as Shakespeare said, out of actually a, a fool of his own in 12th night, you know, you know, God give unto them wisdom that have it, and those that are fools, let them use their talents. Thank you.